but there isn't. There's no landlord. We don't need a landlord. All these bits do very nicely without a landlord. So we even say I this and I that, but it's just convenient language like we talked yet on Thursday, you know, which of course is the other prerequisite for really practicing Tantra to understand emptiness, to understand how there's no inherent I. So it looks like, oh, it looks like we're getting there. So let's look at that, shall we? <coughs> he leaned forward in his chair, grabbed him. Okay, this is very interesting. First level is we need renunciation of the delusions which are the cause of suffering, which means we have to learn to know the delusions, know their voices, know what they say, know how they cause suffering, learn to embrace them, hear them, and then argue with them. That's that gets us renunciation. It gets that gets us a lot of dignity and so oh my gosh, two doggies. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Come here, little one. Yeah. Oh, mummy will take him outside. He doesn't want to go there. He's too nervous. She's too nervous. <laughs> Grab her from the behind. Oh. There you go. Okay. Okay, this is the tricky one that's really, really hard for us. I'm just going to use all these ideas, analogies of roommates and things. I find it most helpful. The key, okay, remember we said renunciation is the first prerequisite to be prepared to practice Tantra. The second one, the second two are bodhicitta and emptiness, you know, so let's look at the emptiness component. Because let's face it, if, as Buddha is saying, we've all got this potential to become a perfect being, a Buddha, fully enlightened, fully wise, fully blissful, fully compassionate, and with a mind pervading the universe with immense power to benefit sentient beings, way to go, baby. If that's our potential, as long as we have this concrete, solid view, I am this and I am that, then it's a joke to say that you can change your mind into the mind of a Buddha. So realizing in general that there is no inherent... Oops, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My hot chocolate and my cheesecake are at the top of my stomach. I'm sorry. <laughs> they stay there. I'm joking. Too much information, I beg your pardon. <laughs> it's very delicious chocolate. Very delicious cheesecake. And we heard Coleman Hawkins. I was completely hooked. As soon as I walked in, I'm like this. I'm like a, I'm like what they say, certain animals, deer, they're really attached to sound. And as soon as I hear that saxophone, you know, or that trumpet, I can't you got me. I can't get out of the room, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, I sort of like that seat to it, you know. That's my big attachment. Well, one of them. Okay. Okay, where was I? Excuse me. Cheesecake. Thank you, cheesecake. Yeah, no, before cheesecake. <laughs> we, yeah, the renunciation of the delusions, all the attachment of the craziness, we've got to become very, very familiar with all those voices in our head, all those roommates, so we really know them well, know what their story is, and the wisdom in us can argue with, the kindness in us can argue with them, and this is the, the point now. So look how we talk. We say, we, I have to notice the wisdom. I have to greet the roommates. I have to not do this. I have to argue that. Can you hear my voices here? I'm saying I, aren't I? Right? Okay. This is the tricky part. And this is what Buddha's saying. It's actually very simple, but we can't hear it. Relatively speaking, conventionally speaking, from language, convenience of language, it is correct to say my roommates. It's correct to say my attachment. It's correct to say my anger. It's correct to say I have to listen to attachment's voice. I have to argue with it. It's correct. Those words are correct. But it's tricky because what we don't realize is it's just like it's like it's like smoke and mirrors. We're using language out of convenience. First point. Second point. Basically what Buddha is saying is Everything in our mind, they're all thoughts, aren't they? They're all thoughts. They're all thoughts. And some of them are deluded and neurotic and fearful and crazy and paranoid and jealous and crazy thoughts which cause all the suffering. And some of those thoughts are kindness and love and generosity and wisdom and they're great. They're the roommates that have got to grow. The other roommates have got to be subdued and eventually chucked out the door. Right? The roommates. So the general point about all the thoughts is this. The general point, and this is the way Buddha will talk, about all thoughts is this. They have to, to be a valid thought, which is a thought that's also virtuous, a valid thought is a thought that 
is relating to something that exists. Can you hear that? Mm -hmm. So I say to you, there are two cups on my table, and this gets us right now down to the bare fundamentals about how we establish something as existing, which is the massive important point for the Buddha because right now, remember, he says, all these crazy deluded thoughts are not in sync with reality. They don't have a basis in reality. They are lying thoughts. Hear the point. They're lying and they happen to be extremely painful and cause suffering. So, speaking simply about thoughts, when I say the words, there are two cups on my table, because we, I, and you'll say, this is, let's just go through this process, you'll say, no, there aren't, Ravina, there is one. And I'll say, how do you know? Do you understand? You, you will say, I'll say to you, how do you know you're right? I might be right. You'll, so what are you going to do? This is, this is how we establish things that exist, and it's really important. What, if I say to you, what do you mean there's only one? How do you know? How am I supposed to know it's true? How do we prove it's true? Another person. Huh? Another person. Okay, that's one part of it. But that person has to be a valid person. They have to, they have to, but even if two people agree, that doesn't mean it's true, is it? The whole world can agree that Hitler was great, but they're all wrong. So what is the proof that this is it? And this is what we get to. We discuss it on Thursday. There's con I'll, I'll give you a hint. There's conventional truth, which is how things exist conventionally, and then there's this ultimate one of emptiness, which we're heading to. So how do we establish that something is true conventionally? And this is really the way Buddha talks about how you establish anything is existing at all. How do you establish this as one? What's one mean? Just speak simply. What's one mean? One. Single one, isn't one. it? One. And what's two? That's two, isn't it? One, two, two, one. So how? So who told us it's one? How do we know it's one? According to whom is it one? My mother. Huh? My mother. Okay. And so your mother, she got. Where did she get the information from? Her mother. Yeah. Okay. So then, no. but where did? How do we prove one is correct? What is it according to? What's the? What's the set of rules that we can uh, refer it to to prove that it's correct? What's that called? Maths. It's called maths, isn't it? So we know in the world there's a there's a set of rules called mathematics. We know that, don't we? And we do know that there was some Arab gentleman a few centuries ago who, thank goodness stop the stupid Roman idea of X's and V's and everything, which were really unmanageable, and he came up with this clever stuff about numbers, didn't he? Mm -hmm. A fellow came up with that, didn't he? But he didn't, he sort of, you could say he invented numbers, didn't he? But he really just took the energy of the universe and he gave it a concept. Would you agree with this? Mm -hmm. So he came up with this, and then over the centuries we've all bought into that, and we all agree that one is single. So who made it up finally? It's a, it's a human mind, isn't it? Do you agree with my point? You see, if you're a Christian, God made the law. And that's what we think of as absolute truth, that God said so. Remember the point I said before, that's not the view here. It's a natural law. So where did it all come from? It came from human mind. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Well, and so what makes it right is not because he said so, because it works, it's manageable, and we all agree. Don't you, don't you agree we all agree? And it all works, mm -hmm. isn't it? Every time I say, give me a, you know, a crown, you don't give me five. Well, I'd be happy if you did. <laughs> or if every time I go for asking one orange, I'll get one orange. Because we've all agreed that one means that. And we've all agreed that that's called a cup. Where did it come from? The evolution of cups go right back. You know, the little beginning people of ours, they would have had their hand on. <laughs> then somebody invented a little rock with a hole in it. Aren't they clever? Then now we have all these fancy cups. So everything exists this way, Buddha says. Everything in the universe exists this way. If you go back and back and back, you'll discover it came from a mind. Are you hearing me, people? It's sort of logical, right? We sort of know this, but we don't get the learning from it. What we do, and this is Buddha's words, we see it and we don't get this. We, we, we forget that we made it up. We forget that. Now, what we do is we give it inherent, intrinsic, holy, out there, permanent, real, absolute, definite nature. We forgot that it all came from our mind, that it's a dependent arising, that we created it, and then we all shake hands and we go, yep, that means one, and so we can all communicate. And it's very comfortable, isn't it? Do you, you understand what I'm saying? This is actually how you establish reality, and this is proving emptiness also. Because there's nothing from the side of one that proves it, that, that makes it one. We call it one, and that's the real meaning. That's the subtlest meaning of emptiness, actually, although it's easy to hear it. So the same with cup. How do I know that's a cup? What's a cup? It's a concept. What's a cup? 
Something Good. So, who said that? Something Good. So we can define it. Like I mentioned on Thursday, if you look at it carefully, we'll say there are two parts to a definition. What's a cup, mummy? Well, it's darling. It's that flat bottom container over there with a handle. She'll say that, won't she? And I'll and I know the meaning of those words. And I'll go, oh, you're right. Look at it. But I'm not happy yet. I don't know what it does yet. I don't know what its function is. So she'll say, well, I'll say, what does it do, mummy? Oh, sweetheart, it holds my tea. Good enough, isn't it? Now that's not enough. Now we do what you said. We get another person to verify that, who's got a valid cognition, who's valid, and we get them to prove this. If, as long as they see there's no contradiction, as long as they don't have another valid cognition that contradicts that, then we can say, it is a cup, I get my tea, I pour it in, I prove it holds my tea, which fits the definition. Guess what? We've now agreed it's a cup. We all shake hands, that's a cup. Who made it up? We did. It's not coming from God. It's not inherent. It's not out there from its own side. It's not in and of itself a cup. We cause it to be a cup, but the marvelous thing is it, 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 it functions as a cup. So it's like, it's like smoke and mirrors. It's like illusion. There's no cup from its own side, but it's convenient and easy to say it's a cup, and we say what it is. We give it a definition, and it proves it. It holds my tea. Good enough. It works. Now, Buddha says that's how everything in the universe exists. Enlightenment, Buddha, good, bad, up, down, punch, kick, book, flower, you name it. Everything, this is the subtlest meaning, everything comes from the mind. But that sounds to us like cheap and easy in the West. We think, oh, therefore it's not really true if it comes from the mind because we want it to have an objective out there, eternal, perfect, from its own side meaning. We don't think we think that. But Buddha says this is what we believe utterly, this inherent out there. It is that. It is that. Nothing to do with me. Not like that. So, the object called I. Okay? I have a nose. I have anger. I have all these roommates and I must be better. I must practice. I must get enlightened. That's not a problem. It's a convenient way to talk and it's very reasonable. But the point is this. Any object the same. I say, my cup has a lovely blue design, has a dragon. My cup has a very nice handle. My cup is really very big. My whole cup holds lots of tea. My cup is made of very nice china. My cup has a lovely bottom. We can talk this way, and it's a true statement. But when we, and this is the point, we have to analyze that. We have to go into it more deeply. Why? Because Buddha says, like I said before, we think there's an inherent cup. We don't think we think that, but he says we do, which means we cling to it as a cup, as a real out there from its own side, inherent, definite, absolutely nice, this cup, that cup, but, and nothing to do with my mind. Nothing to do with mine. We forget that. This is the subtlest meaning of dependent arising. So it is convenient to say my cup has this and that, but when we start to analyse what Buddha says will happen, and this is what we have to do. They study this stuff for 30 years and they go meditate on it for the penny to drop. You once you start to analyse, you can't find anything in the cup that makes it an inherent cup. In fact, the words would be, there is nothing from the side of the cup that makes it a cup. But nevertheless, it is a cup that does function. This is how we talked on Thursday at the Two Truths. So... We can so let's prove this. We started to do it on Thursday, then Bjorn had his all his ideas, and then we had to stop, right? So uh -huh. let's look. In order to establish something as existing, this is conventional truth, conventional reality. Buddha's on about the two truths is conventional and ultimate. It's very shorthand. Conventional. Okay. That means we establish and we have a name cup or Robina, or Karsten. We have a name. So then we have that name and we give it to a certain phenomenon that exists. So in the case here we'll say it's the Danish man with black glasses and a bald head. Over here we'll say it's the, the Australian woman with glasses and a bald head. You know, the short one. He's the tall one. So we can get our definition. It's a, you know, a male person there, a female person here. They're the names and we understand those meanings. So we say Karsten is the label we give to that person over there. You agree? Cup is the label we give to this object here. Yeah, It's a name, it's a label. You agree, it's a name or label. Now, when it comes to self, this is where it gets so tricky. We all truly believe that there is inside me, in one of my, there is one, among my, old ro my roommates, 
We know we're going to find anger, jealousy, love, kindness, generosity. And if we look at the body, we know we're going to find a nose and an ear and a toe, don't we? Mm. They're all the parts of Rabina. Very comfortable. Not a problem. It's easy to see. We can see that, yeah? And I will say I own them, which is reasonable. It's a, it's a conventional statement. But what Buddha is saying is as soon as you start investigating that word I, that thought I, this is the point now, you cannot, and where would you research it? Where would you find it? You'd have to look, where would you search for that I? You'd have to search among the parts, obviously. You'd have to search among the parts for the part called I. Because we think there's a part called I. In other words, I said before, we think there's a landlord who runs the show. I have this. I did that. I said no to this. I said yes to that. I told anger to shut up. I agreed with patience. It's sort of like there's a little landlord in there running around between all the voices, making all the choices and the decisions. It's a feeling we have, isn't it? It's very real, very vivid. There's a very real, really vivid, 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 vivid feeling of a little rabina in there. Walking hand in hand with anger and love and kindness and jealousy. You with me? You with me? Mm -hmm. But all Buddha is saying is you won't find one. You won't find a part called Rabina. Why? Because Rabina is just a name we give to all the bits and pieces. But you can't find among the parts a part called Rabina. And this is where he argues, actually philosophically, with the Hindus. This is where he came out of the Hindu tradition and his main discussion was exactly this one. As the Dalai Lama said, it was the Hindus 3,000 years ago who started this conversation about what is the self, the nature of self, which of course in the Western psychology we're looking at since all our people, Freud and you and all this, you know. And this is the discussion that Hindus had and they came up with quite a subtle finding, sophisticated, marvellous finding, that there is a subtle thing in there that is called it an atma or a self that does give us the basis of being called a self. And Buddha took that further and said, no, you're wrong. There isn't and there can't be. And that's his teachings on emptiness. And it's, it, is, it is highly sophisticated, extremely subtle, highly technical, but absolutely, utterly real, and it's the job we have to learn to do. And all Buddha's saying is when we have finally eradicated the fantasy of the inherent Rabina in there, that's the insight into emptiness, and then from there you become liberated. So it's a, it's a massively important point, not just an interesting intellectual exercise. Are we communicating here? And it's extremely hard. Why? Because we utterly, truly, absolutely in our bones and have believed for eons, believe in a definite, real, solid, independent, inherent little part in there called I that runs the show. And Buddha's simply saying there isn't and there can't be. And that's what we have to unpack and unravel. In just the same way, we will say my cup has a handle and blue paint and a dragon. Perfectly correct, but then we all immediately think, and this is so abstract to us, we don't think this, the eye is a better example. We will think, well, there must be something in there that makes it a cup. But if you strip away the handle and put it there, and you strip away all the blue paint and you put it there, and you strip away all the clay and you put it there, what would you end up with? Nothing. Nothing, right? So you won't find a thing that's called cup that's separate from the dragon, the clay, or the white, or the handle, will you? Are you with me, people? So the same with I. It's shocking, it's shocking, it's shocking. We don't believe it. It's too it's, it's like freaks us out even to think it. If you if I'm simply speaking, if I say, here is Rabina conventionally, not there and there is Karsten, okay? So we've got to say this is Rabina here in this in this grey chair. So now if I'm going to search for this inherent Rabina, which Buddha says we believe in, but which doesn't exist, we have to then search for it. He says, You've got to search for it. You can't just say it's there. You've got to search for it. And it's the searching for it, this is one of the many methods, and then the finding, listen to the words, of the absence of it, the finding of the emptiness of it, that's the realization of emptiness. So, it's like, it's only a says, it's not like you find the eye, then you chuck it out the door. What you find is not the eye, but the absence of the eye, the, the, the non-existence of the eye, of the inherent eye, the inherent eye, the inherent eye. When we get puzzled and we hear that, that's what we have to learn. So let's just do the exercise, you know, if we just start to look for the look for the inherent Rabina that we feel exists when I've been insulted and hurt and offended and, and, and accused and abused and, and you feel this massive roommate as big as the whole room called I, you know. Isn't it? I am so pained. I am so hurt. I am so offended. I did not do that. I did not use it to me. It's so huge for us. And this I, this word I, this thought I, yes, it's a thought is as big as the universe for us. We really believe this thought I does point to a big fat I in there. So we have to search for it, what it says. 
And what you're going to find when you search is all the bits, the love, the hate, the joy, the roommates, the good, the bad, the pee-pee, the caca, the nose, the he, the knee, the toe, the uh, all out there, piles and piles of bits, right? You will not find a piece called Ramina. You will not find a piece called Ramina. The Christians say there is one, and it's called the soul. The, the, the Hindus say there is one, it's called an Atma. And we in the West are trying to find out what the self is, you know, we're using Jung and Freud and all these chaps to try and work it out. Buddha says you won't find that <coughs> inherent, because if it did exist, it would have to be inherent, and this is the point which is a bit subtle for our minds, it would ha if we did find one, a piece called I, it would have to be something that exists without depending on any causes and conditions, without depending on any parts, and most subtly it would have to be existing without depending on the mind calling it that. And what Buddha says is no such thing exists. So we we find that I would take nothing personal. What, darling? If we're lucky uh, enough to establish that there's no I, uh -huh. then we, we start taking anything personal. Yeah, you wouldn't be offended, you wouldn't be jealous, you wouldn't be angry, you'd be extremely blissful, you'd be content, you'd be loving, you'd be empathetic, you'd be blissful, amazing, marvellous, incredibly, <laughs> yep, amazing. Because all our suffering comes from clinging to this fantasy I. That's right, exactly. That's the point. And of course it takes time. Why it's puzzling to us is because we so believe in it. That's all. We believed in it for eons, Buddha says. And the belief in it is so profound and even to hear this, that even our very existence as a human in the samsara with all the world and all the things is based upon the assumption has come as a result of the belief in this I. It's the source of all the samsara universes and worlds and sufferings and happinesses. So it's a pretty enormous thing, this misconception, the misconception. The misconception, and, it's, and of course it's hugely subtle. Start with the words, but then as Lama Zopa says, don't think you've got the realization of it when you know the words. We've got to know the words. But he says the great two signs of any realization of the emptiness of the eye. The first one, which is inferior but already fantastic, is enormous fear. Wonderful. And then the second one, the best, is bliss. That you've seen the truth. So way to go, babies. Learn the words first. <laughs> Get the words right, because that's what you think about. Yes. And then, then the karmic thing wouldn't happen then. What? Uh, the karmic rebirth. Oh, no, you uh, stopped. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Right now. Because we have this grasping at a self-existent me, and then we have this massive attachment to get what that me wants, that's what propels samsara. Yeah. That's what causes us to do negative actions, to harm others, to lie, to kill, to steal, to be angry and jealous, and we keep putting petrol in the tank of, of, of samsara. So when the from the first moment you have your direct insight into this absence of the I, you've got way more to go yet, but the first moment you've cut the, the major root of samsara and you certainly can't fall back. You know where you don't stop the whole karmic thing yet, way to go. But you've done this major turning point, this major shift has happened. You can't fall back into garbage, you know. You can only move forward. So it's a huge point, this first moment of not they call it non conceptual insight into this absence of the I that we think is there. So one of the interesting the point here I'm getting at, not just getting at, one of the points I'm making, which is a way to be very clinical and clear and logical about it to help you know, attack ego's nonsense, is that in the mind, like I'm saying, there's all these thoughts, there's trillions of thoughts, roommates, and the point that Buddha's making about the so-called negative and the so-called positive ones are the positive ones, like love and kindness and intelligence and goodness and compassion and wisdom, these, they, they, as long as there's no, as long as there's still a sense of an I, there's still some lie there, there's still an assumption of an I, but they're relatively speaking in sync with reality. That's why they're not causing suffering. Relatively speaking, they're in sync with reality. And the simple way to say that is, and you can check and prove it, they're relatively speaking in sync with virtue and goodness and harmony and interdependence. Interdependence is how things exist relatively. So if you and I are chatting away being friendly, what's your name? Ingrid. Ingrid. Is Ingrid and I are having a good time enjoying and I'm listening to her story and she, you know, identifies with my pain and I worry about her headache and she laughs at my jokes and I laugh at hers. We're being kind and loving, aren't we? So we know at that time love and kindness and empathy is prevalent, isn't it? Easy, isn't it? But look what happens when suddenly, you know, I insult you. Suddenly this feeling of interdependence and harmony and a sense of we gets cut in half, doesn't it? And suddenly there's poor me over here and mean ugly Ingrid over there and you're feeling all sorry for yourself, how dare you say that to me? And so 
interdependence has gone out the window, hasn't it? And there's this vivid feeling of a concrete separate eye, isn't there? And that's experientially how we know about when the more miserable you are, the more attachment, anger, jealousy, pride, and misery, the more you're separate and lonely and cut off from people. You understand? But the more love and kindness, the more connected you are with others. So it's not all the way yet. You've got to realize emptiness as well. But that's a good step in the right direction of, of, of um, interdependence. Do you understand? Connectedness, which is reality conventionally. So, the, so they, relatively speaking, have some basis in reality is what I'm getting at, those thoughts. But the negative thoughts, the delusions, the neuroses, the, the, the crazy roommates, have no basis at all. They're thoughts that have no basis. There are thoughts that don't point to anything that's true. And that, that we can understand. So right back to there are two cups on my table. There are two cups on my table, I will say, according to the law of numbers and the understanding of the words, my table, one cup, like that. You can say with confidence, of course, we're talking conventional, that that's a not a correct thought. You can say that, can't you? And you can prove it to me. You don't, you don't bully me into believing it. You don't say God says there's only one. You're wrong, which is how we think of morality. It's nonsense. You prove it by going back to numbers. You help me understand numbers. Maybe you check my eyes and check my glasses to see what the mistake is. And then you can, then you can help me see the truth, can't you? Can't you? You see, because truth is relative. Truth is conventional. Truth, truth is what we all agree upon, that, that things work on. We agree. That's conventional truth. So, I then sort out my problem, realise my numbers are wrong, fix up my glasses, look again, I say, oops a daisy, you're absolutely right. There's one cup on my table. I would say that, wouldn't I? So what happened to the other thought? There are two cups on my table. What happened to it? It was in my mind before, wasn't it? Yeah? What happened to it now? Where's it gone? Dissolves. Dissolves. Utterly gone. And what made it go? The other, because the other uh, thought is more real. That's right, precisely. Seeing the truth, not believing in it, but seeing it and proving it and knowing the truth, getting a direct insight into the truth, there is in fact one cup, that annihilated the life of my mind, didn't it? So the certainty of seeing the truth is what causes you to remove the lies and this is the process you go through to get enlightened because an enlightened mind is a mind that only sees truth. There's no longer any lies left. And this is how you get rid of all the divisions. But it's just more subtle and more difficult. Are we communicating? It's like this. It's logical. It's not mystical. It's not hippy trippy. It's not cross your fingers and hope for the best. It's not just belief. You've got to work real hard. And slowly, we we become our virtuous, virtuous minds. States of mind now are in sync with reality. And the and the lies have left the mind. Then all the remits, the neurotic remits, are all gone. They're full of bliss and full of joy. Is that a question, Carsten? Yes, it is. Um, um, the convention that we have to label is like this is chair. This is Everything's labeled. We have to label. We have to communicate. Otherwise, oh, please pass me the thing. Or that's right. Looks like that's based communication are difficult. That's right. That's Precisely. Like that's why yeah. names and labels and definitions are so vital to communicate. That's yeah. right. But they also, even though vital, but they can also be. Hostile. What do you mean? Well, I'm not hostile. You label something as anger or fear. Yeah. But, but if it is, you have to prove it is that. We're talking real yeah. logic here. Yeah. Is there something called anger? Well, then, no, there isn't something. No, there is. Conventionally. It's, it's conventionally. Yeah. Is there a thing in your mind called anger? What is anger? No. What's the definition? It's a, it's a label put on, on a feeling. And then You're right. So what's, what is anger then? What is, this, what is it referring to? It's referring to something that goes on in the mind, isn't it? Name, anger or attachment, speak it more simply. Attachment is a name we give referring to something. What does it refer to? You see, this is two, two, two separate things here. There is in my mind a thing called attachment, and there is the name attachment which we give to it. So what it's referring to is correct. It is a neurotic part of me that over-exaggerates the deliciousness of the cake. So would you accept that that's a good definition of attachment, let's say. So there is the name attachment, and it does refer to that part of my mind. So that's a valid statement. 
You see, listen, that is a valid statement, Carsten. But then we have to see whether the thing that the name attachment is referring to, which is a state of mind, itself, whether it's a valid description of reality. So we have to then investigate the cake to see if it is so divine, if it is so delicious, and then we realise it's not. And then we realise, although attachment does exist, it's an incorrect assessment, and that's how it disappears. It's still true that it, I've got it in my mind. It's still true I have a thought there are two cups. It's a true thought. It is a thought, but it's not, it's, it's not a valid thought because it has no basis in reality. So attachment is a thought, but what it refers to, divine delicious cake that when I get it, I'll get happy, that is not correct. So that's why it is a thought, but it does not refer to reality. And when I've seen that, the, the attachment will disappear like a puff of smoke. That's how you get enlightened. Do you see my point? Good. He's a good husband. He gets educated. He's my husband, isn't he? Right? He gets educated very easily. <laughs> yes, Sebastian. Just to have it very clear, so we said no Atman, no soul exists. Yeah, and no, yeah, and no. How then is mind fundamentally different from soul? What's this the diffuse feeling of that day? Okay, I understand. So, what's have. the definition of mind? Yes. Do you know? Do you know Buddhist definition? No, I don't. I'll think tell you. I've I'll tell you. I know okay. Buddha's definition of mind. He says mind is something that does exist. It's a name we can give. It's got two parts. The definition: that which is clear, which is not physical, and then that which cognizes. That's what the definition of a mind is. So your Sebastian's mind is used in a multiple ways in Buddhism. It can refer to your mind stream in general, your continuity of moments by moments of thoughts or a particular one state of mind, there's different things. There's no one part of you, it's not like some of a part, like a brain you can point to. It's your very thoughts themselves is known as mind, consciousness. And all of those parts of you, all the deluded ones as well, they're all mind. And their function is to cognize, is to be aware or is to know something. That's their job. That's their job. That's the call, the mind. That does exist, Buddha says. That does exist. Sebastian's mind is what causes you to be a sentient being. You're called a mind possessor. In Tibetan, you're a mind possessor. The difference between a dead Sebastian and a live one is the presence of Sebastian's mind, consciousness, capacity for cognition. Now, within that mind stream, like I'm saying, the sensory consciousness, which is your mind functioning through the body. There is your mental consciousness, which is all your thoughts and feelings and emotions and unconscious, and some are negative, some are positive, and some are neutral. Millions of bits of your mind. That exists, Buddha says. That's your mind. But that's not your eye. Your eye is something else. No, that's clear. So therefore, it's not your yeah. conscious, it's not your atma, it's not yourself. It's mind personal? Of course it is. Your mind is your... Darling, if you practice piano every day, I don't get good at piano. That'd be very good. <laughs> if you get angry every day, I, I don't get the imprints and get angry. Yeah. But we pass imprints on. To what? The, my next... Okay. My, my, this my, my, moment of your consciousness, it's, <coughs> it necessarily came from a previous moment of that same continuity of consciousness. And you can prove that. I'll go back to this morning. You mightn't remember most of today, but you know there's an unbroken chain of mental moments that we label Sebastian's thoughts. Would you agree? <laughs> so you keep tracking that back, Buddha says, and you won't find a beginning because you can't, because you can't find a first moment. We want a first moment desperately. We assume there must be such a thing. But if we posit cause and effect, that this comes from that, which comes from this, which comes from that, you can't have a that that didn't come from something before. Therefore, your mind is beginningless. Very, hang on, darling. Very simple. Keep it, keep it. It's good. Very simple. And it is endless. In a simple sense, everything Sebastian does now keeps putting petrol in the tank that keeps it driving forward. So in a general sense, your mental continuum, which is your personal one, what you put in it ripens in the future for you. The, you know, the, the, the anger and jealousy and neurosis and killing and loving and compassion you put in now will bring its own fruits further down the track in the same mind stream. Right? That's clear, Buddha says. That's how it works. Mm. So the job is to remove all the pollution from the mind, which will ripen its future suffering because you're sick of suffering. And then as you purify this mind stream of yours, one way of saying it is, right now you could say your mind is kind of stuck in your body, isn't it? We can't remember most of today. We can't see very far. We can't hear very far. Our mind's very limited right now. 
and we're not accessing 99% of it, Buddha says. I'm talking about the brain here. So as you keep purifying your mind, keep letting the, the rubbish go, literally you can say you expand your consciousness. You'll eventually get clairvoyance, which means it's a deeper part of your mind that can cognize phenomena that the senses and the concepts can't cognize, like the past, like the future, like the other side of the wall, like my mind. That's the power of our mind at a subtle level. As you keep purifying, keep removing, realize emptiness, get more compassion, bodhicitta, you become this amazing, powerful mind that eventually when you've accomplished perfection, literally your consciousness, just like the Christians talk about God, will be existing wherever there is existence. Because actually your mind is now utterly purified and how can something that is not physical be confined by space or time or matter? It cannot be. So it will be literally pervading the universe, it will know that which exists perfectly, including the minds of all beings, and it will have infinite compassion for every being, and it will have infinite power to benefit everyone perfectly. That's a Buddha mind, and that's the potential of every mind. And that mind is what defines us, and that's the job of doing what we're talking about. That's your mind. So then, question? <laughs> no, I think it, it's, it's answered actually, but okay. I still, I, on okay. a very... Of course, yes. Feeling of course, level. That's right, there is an eye. I think that's of what course. I'm still struggling most with. And that's it definitely right. comes from this. You're, you're using the, the parts approach to prove that yes. there's no eye. Like yes. it's not the finger, it's that's not right. the ear. That's right. But I guess we all have this feeling. There is one. I can cut off my nails. Yes, that's right. Still, there is something back. That's right, that's right. I we feel can it. cut off yes. my finger. Right. Still, so there is something back. So we, we do it. have this yes. idea of. Uh, there is something, something inherent. We, we all know it's not the hand. I can cut this oh, hand off. That's right. Can, and the nose. And but the that ear. remains a yeah, feeling that's of right. That's right. this something. And what Buddha says is and that thing, that feeling of something, is called ignorance or ego grasping, which is eons old, which utterly believes there is this roommate called Sebastian <coughs> who does run the show, who is the boss. Yeah. That's one of the strong ways we think of the self as like a landlord, a boss, who does this and is that and has this and wants this and doesn't do this. So what all Buddha is saying is at the subtlest level, that's what we have to get to realise, it's just the use of a word. It's convenient to say Sebastian. So one way to say it is Sebastian is a name that refers to these parts. Nothing wrong with that. That's easy. But Sebastian is not in the parts. It sounds semantics, but it's deeply, profoundly true, it seems. You understand? And that's what yeah, the doing. labeling part is easy. No, I, I think know. the difficult bit is yeah. that we still, we've we grown that's up right. to think soul is something that's right. positive. No, that's right. We seek that's it, right. we want it to, that's right. actually we want to find it, to nurture yeah. it, to make it good. That's right. We're not historic of the way I've grown up, I'm not yet quite there to let go of that as saying it's just... So. Yeah, the soul. So, we're clear here, there right. is no soul. No, well, see, the, the point is about that, though. We hear that, and that shocks us because we think there's no good part of us because we've got a view of the soul, whereas the Buddha would say mm -hmm. you've got subtle consciousness, which is in its nature pure. So you could argue it's another way of saying the same thing. So it's a question of your definition. That's what I, that's the what Buddha's I'm main point is that what he refers to as an atma or a soul or a self it's not so much a question of good or bad, and that's how we feel about it because we've been educated. It's more what's mistaken is that it's the way we think it exists and the words the Buddha uses is we think there's something inherent, intrinsic, which means first something that does exist that doesn't depend on causes and conditions. The second one, which is the tasty one here, it's something that doesn't exist in dependence upon your parts. In other words, there is a part, there's another part called soul as well as ear and love and hate. And all Buddha is saying is it's an unnecessary embellishment. Because if your consciousness, like I just said, can manifest in the universe with infinite compassion, infinite love for all beings, and have the wisdom to see their minds and never stop for eons to benefit them, I don't know why you should worry about not having a soul. If your mind can do that, you should be quite content. <laughs> you sort of see my point. Yeah. You see my point? Yep. Okay, so this is interesting to think about, isn't it? Yeah. What else? Yes. Um, this Buddha mind is, is, is this Buddha this, mind, okay? Is this an uh, individual? Okay. When again, when you are Buddha, and he is Buddha, and you are Buddha, you could argue that you're the same Buddha. 
There's a way of saying it. Because your consciousness will pervade the universe and know everything and have infinite love and empathy for every single sentient being as if they're you. Your consciousness will pervade the universe and have, see the minds of all beings and have infinite love and compassion as if they were you. And he would too. So you're not going to bump into each other in the sky sort of thing. Because it's not physical. It's actually pure, clear, blissful, perfect energy. Like we talk about when I learned as a Catholic, you know. I love the idea of God is everywhere. That's exactly how they talk about Buddha mind, consciousness. The difference is everyone can become that one rather than there being one there who made everybody. So that is our pure potential. And so you can say that then that Buddha mind can then have the capacity, and that's all of you three when you become Buddha, you have the capacity out of this infinite power, infinite wisdom, and infinite compassion to ben because you want to benefit others spontaneously and you have the wisdom to know how, you have the power to manifest this mind of yours in millions of forms, bopping around as a dog, a human, an ant, a cat, to this, to that, a spirit, to benefit sentient beings. So you could say there are trillions of emanations of the Buddha mind. Mm -hmm. Trillions of emanations. But in a sense you could say, when we all become Buddha, there's one Dharmakaya, there's one omniscient consciousness. It's a way of talking. Do you understand? Yeah, I understand. So right now, we all are our separate selves because of delusions. Yeah. Because I believe in my inherent me and you believe in your inherent me. And as long as we kind of work nicely together, we're okay. We'll put up with each other. If it get too difficult, we will not. Hey, I is my eye and there's your eye. So when you begin, to, when you've realized emptiness already, even then you cut down this to a massive degree. You no longer have a sense. You're like I said to you, you'd be blissful. And then when you put compassion into the mix, it's literally others now. Your sense of self by now, you could say, is as big as the universe. It encompasses everybody. So in that sense, even the lowest, even the beginning stages of accomplishing bodhicitta, there's no longer the thought of the neurotic eye. There's no longer the thought of I want something or I don't want something or you did this to me. None of that. That's gone, you know, way beyond. So you keep growing that. I mean, we can't conceive of it. Best we can do is say words. Way beyond the sense of a limited little separate little lonely me, which is the function of delusion and ego, and that's the only thing we know is true. Do you see? Uh, let me say, uh, this mind... The, the origin of this mind. Origin? What's origin mean? Yeah. What's origin mean? Where, where, where okay, good. Let me, like oh, I described here. Is, you see, you want a, so you want a first moment. Yeah. You want a first moment. Yeah. You want a first moment. Good. Okay, I'm just making sure. That's your question. What's yeah. the first moment? Yeah. Okay, good. That's my point to you. And yeah. that's what we, something instinctive in us. So Buddha says, what a ridiculous question. Yeah. I'll tell you why. So let's just be very simple and boring and logical. So there you're called Yen. So Yen has a consciousness, right? So this moment of your conscious experience comes from where? Uh, uh, answer me. Where? Where does it come? The previous second. The, the previous. It's a chain of mental moments. Logically speaking, this moment. If you okay, let's follow this cup. Where's the first moment of the cup? <laughs> well, where did this cup come from? We first established it's clay. If you keep tracking this cup to the clay, to the mountain, to the previous mountain, you'll keep going and you'll get back a billion years. And where did that come from? Well, that must have come from something before. And you get back 20 billion years and you get back to the first moment of this universe. And then as the Dalai Lama says, no problem because the world comes down to being the four elements and all the physical elements subsume down to the wind element. But that wind element is existing and it has a big bang, he says, no problem. Just not the first Big Bang, that's all. So that subtle wind energy has to have come from previous four elements, which came from previous four elements, and you will never find the first moment. Christians and Muslims deal with it by saying, God did it. But we, we just should not ask where he came from. That's a rude question. Do you see my point? But the Buddha says your consciousness, you follow your consciousness back, which is not physical energy, to this moment. And you, if you had perfect memory, you know you could track it back in a perfect chain of mental moments, millisecond by millisecond, back to your first second in your mummy's womb. You agree? And then you think, well, where did that moment come from? It has to have come from a previous moment of that continuity of consciousness. And then where did that come from? A previous moment. You go back a million years and you keep doing this and you will never, you can't find the first moment because you have to ask the question, where did that moment come from? And you have to say a previous moment. So you can't have a thing that didn't have a previous cause. So therefore, consciousness and matter are beginningless, Buddha says. The, the, uh, the, the original... My, my, but Sorry, what? Bit, Sorry, what, 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 what? Um, how do I say it? Uh, this, this mind. Which mind? 
that floats through uh, time from there. No, it's just a word we give to your mental continuum. Yeah. So yeah, your but, mental continuum is the series of your thoughts, thoughts. throughout this day. Yeah, yeah. So you go back and back and you can't find the first yeah. original moment of those thoughts, can yeah. you? No. But you keep saying, where's the original moment still? Yeah. Yeah, go on. But this mind. Which mind? <laughs> You're meaning the continuity of your, we know it, we're labeling yeah. it your mind. The, the continuity of your consciousness. consciousness. Your consciousness, the yeah. river of your mental moments. Okay, go on. Yeah. Yep, go on. Has this ever before been a Buddha mind? Okay, okay. Let's ask the question. What is a Buddha? I'll tell you. A Buddha, remember I said before, is a consciousness that's absolutely, completely rid of all the neuroses. There's not an atom of negativity in that mind, not an atom of ego, not an atom of anger, not an atom of love, uh, a co of negativity, no atom in that mind. So if that's where how you were a million lives ago, what would have been the cause for you to grow anger in your mind if there was no seed of anger? How could you ever have anger again? If there's no seed there, you've burned all the seeds of de delusion. So if you have been Buddha in the past, you certainly would be Buddha now. You can't possibly not become a Buddha. If so, don't bother trying so hard to be a Buddha if you can lose it again. It's, it's not logical. So in other words, this, egg, this chicken here, we know it came from an egg. And we know it's evolution from eggs and chickens and chickens and eggs. But you can, you can, then it will have an egg. That egg, we can break it, and you'll never get another chicken. Mm -hmm. So if you never have an, that continuity of eggs and chickens, if you break the egg, it's finished, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So you'll never get a chicken again, will you? Mm -hmm. Well, if you've removed all the seeds of negativity from your mind, it's impossible that they will come again. Mm -hmm. Impossible. Mm -hmm. So you, you have what they say is, you're, you, they talk about how we possess. Buddha nature. Our mind is pure in its nature. And we can mistakenly think that means we were Buddha once and we lost the plot. And I remember having a discussion with one of my, I've got a Jesuit priest friend, and he says that is, that's a big discussion they have because I said that's not logical, that's madness. You can't have been oneness with God and then lose it. And he says, he says they have that discussion because it demands what the nature of God means. So Buddha would say if you've been Buddha once, it's not possible to lose it. Impossible to lose it because now it's permanent. Now you've you've burned all the negative seeds, so they can't grow again. This is the point. This is why it's confident. Sort of, it should make us confident. This is why when I said when you see the truth simply that there is one cup, there's no space ever for two cups to come back into my mind. It's burned. It's gone because I've seen the truth. Do you see? But I mean, this is really Christianity, isn't it? No. Adam and Eve in paradise, and then yeah. they mm. act against God, and mm. this is a. So. Well, that's the misconception. That's the way, and this is what my Jesuit friend said. It, it is quite a difficult issue. It's not that easy to say we were God once and then we lost it, or we were oneness with God and then we lost it. He says we have there are problems with that, and the certain Buddhist view, it's not possible. It's not logical. So the idea that we all possess Buddha nature and the idea that our mind is pure, what it means is. It's like this. I like this example. If I see, an, if you have an acorn, you know, we all know what an acorn is, don't we? Mm. The seed of an oak tree, okay? So listen to this carefully. It's how Buddha's talking. We would just, I say, Mummy, what's that? And we'd just see this little round thing with a hat on it, wouldn't we? You know, a little cute little thing with a hat on it. There it is. And that's an acorn. And it's true, it is an acorn. It is a little round thing with a hat on it. It is true. But then your mummy says, well, look, darling, and I'll say, well, what does it do, mummy? And she said, well, sweetheart, see that big tree over there? That's an oak tree. If you put that in the ground, it'll become that. Well, first of all, you go, come on, who are you trying to kid? Because it looks ridiculous. Who can see? It's not evident. There's no relationship between a little round thing and a beautiful oak tree. It's just my analogy. So, but if you analyse it, an acorn, the way Buddha would answer, what is it? He'd say it's a we'd say it's a potential oak tree. It's true, isn't it? And you could say, logically, that... All acorns, by definition, possess oak tree nature. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. By definition, what an acorn is is a potential oak tree. You don't hold it in the sky waiting for it to become an oak tree. You've got to give it water, soil, and lots of time. But we know that it possesses the potential to be an oak tree. So we just say it's a seed for an oak tree. So that's the analogy they use. So my, this is Buddha's point. Mind, your mind, my mind, the dog's mind, Hitler's mind, by definition, by definition, is now an, o an acorn, let's say. It's, not, it's, it's undeveloped. Mm -hmm. It's deluded, pathetic, nonsense, rubbish mind. But because it's a mind which has the, it has the potential to be free of delusions and full of goodness, 
therefore a Buddha. It's got that potential and it's, as long as a mind exists, it can never lose that potential. That's logical. As long as an acorn exists, it's always a potential oak tree. As long as our mind exists, it possesses Buddha nature. It possesses the potential. And Buddha's point is this. You see, we in the West think, and it's just our materialist view, it's my way of saying it, we identify with being an acorn. And we spend our lives being a nice acorn, the best acorn. We polish ourselves up and make sure we're a thin acorn and put maybe new hats on mm. and we best <laughs> want to be the best acorn. You kind of get my point here because we don't realise we have any potential. We just think we're acorns. I mean, how pathetic, how sad, you know, not allowing yourself to become who you really are. So Buddha says, you, you hear about a Buddha, enlightened, pervading the universe, manifesting millions of forms throughout the universe, dependent on sentient beings, infinite compassion, we go, don't be ridiculous, I haven't got that potential. But that's what Buddha's findings are, is that every mind has that potential naturally and it is impossible not to have it. Because anyway, minds are beginning as an endless, so you'll always have it. So how about using it and growing it? That's the way to say it. That's also depressing. But tell me. It's also depressing. Who? Uh, that we have been acorn since endless life. That's right. We've never been acorn. Acorn, that's right. Uh, it's sort of common. Of course, it's good that we can become good at That's right. We've, we've got to remember to do the job. Yeah. That's what we forget. Uh, and that, this, is the, this is the point, you see, again. Because we're so addicted to being a little miserable, little small, little me, little Rabina, this, that, whatever, and that's all we think we are, then we keep identifying with, the, I keep identifying with being the best acorn. But we've got to start. Even though it's a bit abstract for us, we've got to start identifying with our potential. And that's, babies, is Tantra. This is Tantra. This is where we get naturally into Tantra. They say that what Tantra is, one way of saying it, they say you bring the future result, your Buddhahood, into the present by imagining it. But imagining it, visualizing it identifying with it. You actually, in these practices, you know, this is all very I mean, unusual for us, seeing all these strange forms, but they're all just psychological qualities. So, for example, over here, Tara, this gorgeous looking lady with naked breasts and very cute looking, you know, and a pretty face and very Indian and five-pointed crown and holding this and holding that. Looks like cute Indian art, which indeed it is. But it's, it's a visual language, actually, and that is something that's come from India. It's a couple of thousand years old, several thousand years, and that is rep represents the quality of an enlightened mind that's called power, action. She represents action energy. Cut through the obstacles, make things happen, be successful. Buddha's mind has three essential characteristics when it's fully developed. Wisdom, which is manifested by, for example, Manjushri. Manju. There we are. Manjushri. He's holding a sword. Isn't that? No, he's not. The other one. Here he is. Manjushri. Manju. Gentle voice. Yes, it's Indian. Yes, it's Tibetan. It's, it is esoteric. It is not our culture. But like anything, it's a language. You can learn it. Like Danish to me is completely esoteric. But I can learn it, hey? So it's not esoteric anymore, isn't it? Same here. So that represents wisdom. The sword, fire, the tip, cutting through ignorance. So wisdom. Then here is compassion, Chen Rezig, compassionate eyed one, infinite love and compassion. And this is Tara, this one. She's got, you know, over there, she's there, the statue. She represents power. So it's the wisdom, it's the compassion to want to help sentient beings, infinite empathy with their pain. The infinite wisdom of gone beyond ego and therefore the, the and therefore the power, therefore the wisdom to know their minds perfectly and how to benefit them. And she, this is the power to do so. So in your life, you need compassion to want to help somebody. You've got to have the wisdom to know how to be an acupuncturist, and then you have to have the power to be a good acupuncturist. You need these three to benefit sentient beings. So they're the three qualities of an enlightened being. So this is just visual language, you know. Visual, it represents these qualities. And then so in one of the key ways we practice what they call deity yoga, based upon all the understandings, which we haven't gone into much, we can do more tomorrow, you visualize yourself, for example, as Tara. You visualize Tara out there. You visualize, the they say it's the end result, what you can become. You visualize Tara in this form, representing this. You buy into that she represents this. And then at some point you do various things and blah, and blah, mantra, and this and that. You then bring it into you and there's a way you do that. They dissolve this into you and you become, you imagine, identifying 100%, I am Tara. So we, you know, this is a cause. We call it positive thinking in our culture. You know, it's all affirmations. We call it, but identifying with your future result, 
by saying I am Tara and then during the day when you've had a when you receive initiation into these practices you are committed to seeing yourself in this way identifying yourself in this way you know and this is and what this is it is the cause for becoming it and if you think about it when you're really practicing that music at the piano and you vision you're you're in love with your teacher your marvelous Bach teacher, you know, you're visualizing Bach, you're thinking of Bach, you're trying to channel Bach, you're trying to become your own Bach. And this is how you really move forward. If you sit there thinking, oh, I can't play by Bach, oh, this is, I'm hopeless, I can't play piano, I'm useless, I'm nobody, I'm nothing. Believe me, you'll never play the piano. But if you have this confidence, which is this divine pride, they call it, we've got to make that shift very clearly in our mind. I can become the Buddha. I I will be the Buddha, and then you—that's a cause for becoming it, along with all the other practices which support you underneath. You know, it's a very powerful psychological technique for quickly becoming your very own oak tree. You kind of see what I'm saying? A little bit. Okay. And this is based on strong renunciation. Strong emptiness, no inherent eye there, because if there is an inherent Rabina, she can't become some green lady, believe me. And uh, no, and, and, and Bodhicitta, the wish to bend the sentient beings. So the renunciation is the basis. The emptiness is the skill that enables you to actually technically do it. But Bodhicitta, compassion, is the reason you want to do it. That's what compels you to want to become a Buddha, because the suffering of sentient beings is so unbearable, you know. That you must become a Buddha as quickly as possible for their sake. So these three are crucial. They are the fuel that you use to transform <coughs> your mind, your acorn, which doesn't have an inherent nature of being an acorn. You're not stuck with being an acorn. This is what can cause you to become your Buddha. They're infinitely powerful, infinitely wise, infinitely compassionate. This is the idea of chantry. Are we communicating? Good. So why don't we just do a little practice? We can do a little bit of time. I mean, I'm starting early, you know. Oh, it's tea time, isn't it? Tea time. You need another break? break. Tea break. Then we can do a meditation, okay? We'll do a little tar meditation to give you an example of how it works. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Tea break. I'll read my iPad. I haven't read the news yet. Where's my iPad, though? Where's my iPad?
Can I give you more to say? All right, any questions? It's all this debate you're having every time, so tell me all your questions. Come on, share them with me, please. Any questions? Before we do the time, so we'll do the, we'll do a little meditation to finish the day. So we don't need to finish at five. Yeah, we, that's a pretty long day and it's intense, so we might finish earlier. We'll see how we go. But any questions before that? So come on, you, use your questions, sweetheart. Yeah, to go on. I really um, like your way of explaining the, the karma. Yeah. And I was talking about the emptiness. No, I. No, no self. That's right. And I really want Put these to two understand together. Yep. how the karmic consequences yep. is a kind of. So the implication of your question is if there's no I, how can there be karma? Isn't it? Mm -hmm. so, so, well, is that your implication? Yeah. Okay. Sure. That's the implication. No, no, I don't think you see. So then, why do you say, why do you say well, how does karma work then? It's not yeah. the implication. I mean, uh, we're explaining that uh, we've done a lot of things before, and yeah. therefore we live as we do now. That's right. Uh, so if I act in a certain way now, uh -huh. how can that affect my future lives as something, and how is that something? Um, it's your consciousness. Intuitive. It's your consciousness. You have a consciousness right. and you have a body. Okay. That's the basis of the name. I forget your name again. Mm -hmm. What's your name? Geske. 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 So Geske is the name we give to this combination of body and mind. Do you agree? So this body and mind, we know the body came from Geske's mummy and daddy. But the Buddha would say this consciousness came from when you were Mary and Fred and dog and aunt and who knows, like the rest of us, back and back and back. So labels changed on this continuity of mind. So here you are as Geske. Practicing Buddhism, practicing morality, understanding emptiness, putting in lots of virtuous imprints, probably the other ones too, join the club, we're all human. So that will then ripen, and then the main karma that ripens at the time of Geska's death, depending on your practice, if it's strong morality, that will cause you to run to a new human mummy's womb, and you'll keep on bopping on your spiritual path and another new body. Your mind continues. The body will come again. The way I mean Choices right there yeah. is a karmic result. That the what you are thinking right now is the fruit. <coughs> what you are at this moment is the is the total of what not the total but the result of what you've done before. And what you do with this will produce the future. So whatever's in your garden now, if it's full of weeds because you haven't done a good job, you've got to pull the wretched weeds out. Mm -hmm. And then whatever you do with this garden will produce the next garden, won't you? It's sort of very totally logical. Yeah. Right. And when and the, you say consciousness is the same as mind. mind. They're synonymous, basically, in this general use. Excellent. Exactly. So the point about the I, when we grasp strongly at the I, believe in the inherent I, and that gives lots brings rise to lots of attachment to get what that I wants, and then anger when it doesn't get what it wants, and then jealousy and low self esteem and that causes to lie and steal and kill. This all comes from believing strongly in the neurotic I. So if you live your life this way, then you're polluting your garden again, and then when you die, it'll be like tiger life or here, you know, dog life or whatever. Because so the belief in the eye, the grasping of the eye makes big has a big role in what we do and how we do it. This is Buddha's point. You know? So the more you let go of the I, the more virtue you practice, the more light you become, the more clear you become, the more powerfully moral and kind and wise and so all the right seeds in your mind. That's the idea. Yes, sweetheart. But we have a kind of I, no? It's what do you mean? Tell me what you mean by that. To communicate, like the cop. It's, it's a name we use so we don't get confused. A name and a body and a No, no, wait a minute. Just a minute. No, 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 no. Not like that. This is where it gets a little bit sort of, sounds a bit sort of technical and boring, but it's quite accurate. Let's, let's listen. Do you agree that the name for this is iPad? Well, I'll tell you it's an iPad. No, it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a Kindle, okay? It's an iPad. Okay. Okay. So the label for this machine is an iPad. The name for it is the iPad. Okay. And then we know it's made of parts. If we were really clever, we'd say the parts. We don't know. I don't know. But it's got a glass front and it's got all the software inside and the case, yeah? So the software, the glass, and the case are the parts of this that are referred to by iPad, would you agree? Okay. So it's right to say this iPad has glass software and, and you know, uh, case. But 
Then we would then Buddha says, but you won't find anything in here that's iPad. It's just a name you give. There are the parts. There is the glass. There is the the, the software, and there is the case. So then we'll go. Oh, that's an order of relief. There is something good. There's glass. Okay, grasp at the glass. No, glass is a name out of convenience that we use to refer to this combination of sand and something that's ground and made strong. So it, well, it does break, unfortunately. It's the name we give to the parts of glass. And if you know about glass, you know it's got parts, right? So we'll say, oh, what a relief, because apparently glass is made of sand, isn't it? Yeah? So then we'll go, oh, that's good, there are the parts. There must be the sand. There's the parts. <laughs> no, what sand? That's a name you use to refer to its parts. And that's it's like tricky. Everything exists like that. So we'll say, I have a nose and an ear. And there's no eye that owns them because there's no Rabina. Oh, but I have an ear. Oh, what a relief. No. Once we then investigate what's the ear, ear is merely a name we give to its parts. And then we go, oh, well, there's a lobe. Look, it's got a part. A lobe. No. Ear lobe is a name we give to, it's the name referring to its parts. And you, no matter what you posit where, just concentrate. No matter what you posit, there's something that is a name that has parts. And everything exists like this. So there's no enlightenment either. Enlightenment is a name you give to its parts, all the virtuous states of mind and all the wisdom. That's what the parts of enlightenment are. So, oh, what a relief, there must be the parts. There's enlightenment, there's, there's, there's wisdom. No. Wisdom is the name you give to its part. So everything in the universe is a way of talking about how everything in the universe exists and it works to talk this way. But all Buddha is saying is we think there's an inherent ear, inherent enlightenment, inherent me, inherent you, inherent good, inherent bad, a bad action called killing. Killing is a word used to refer to the action of taking the life of a sentient being. And we'll go, oh, that's definitely negative. That's a negative action inherently. There is nothing inherent in the action of killing. Killing is a name we give to the action of putting the knife in the dog's heart and seeing it's dead. So there's all these parts of what's called killing. So there's no killing from its own side. So what our trouble is, we hear that and we tend to think, oh, there's no I from its own side. Oh, that's okay, it's all empty, therefore it doesn't matter. And that's one of our big misconceptions, like I said on Thursday. We rush to the wrong view. So killing does exist. Enlightenment does exist. I does it, do exist. Flower does exist. But there's nothing inherent in the flower that calls it flower. There's nothing inherent in Rabina. There's nothing inherent in killing. But killing is negative. It does harm sentient beings. But you won't find inherent killing in there. Everything exists like this. Everything exists like this. Are we communicating? So the point is, of course, to get the meaning of that. It sounds like clever intellectual words, you know. The meaning to get from this, as Lama Zoburte says, then the base can't be the label. Sorry. The base, the parts, can't be the label. So, what's your question? Um, you were saying briefly before the the chief that uh, when we are ready to give up this I, it will be very very big struggle for us. It's oh, like it's going through a dark valley or something. Or yeah. Yeah. Well, it's very scary because we believe in it. So yeah. giving up something that we're clinging to is always hard. Giving up eating too much chocolate cake. Giving up believing that my boyfriend adores me when he doesn't. Would you say that you will go through a mental state that is very, very? That's it. You keep coming up with this point. It's interesting. Yeah, going you keep this is the like point. A big mental. No, it's not like that. It's slowly. Like oh, giving up this I or this ego is like the the dark night of the soul or. You could call it that if you like. Yeah. yeah. But it's it's very real when you when you do it. Of course it is. Yes. That's yeah. right. Exactly. It is. So what else, people? Then we can do Tara. Then we can go home. I mean, I'm not rushing to go home or anything, but just saying. <laughs> I'm just giving you the, the few steps in the future. I always like to see where we've come from, where we are, and where we're heading. So, what other question? No? Alright. There's one. There's where? Where? Here. Oh, sweetheart. Um, What's your name? 
Pickrick. Pickrick, je connais. Moi, oh, je crois que je suis bien. Je me demande si le bouddhisme ne se clash avec l'évolution. Tell me, Han. Tell me about it. Explain. Uh, I mean, all this attachment, yeah. uh, anger, desires, greed, and needs. Yeah. We needed those to survive in prehistoric times. I understand, that's right. Like I said your point. The, the lions and tigers yeah, that's right. killed us yes. if we hadn't killed them. That's right. So the so point of this, the, the conclusion from this. Aren't we fighting against nature? I understand. Okay. So first of all, let's give some historical context to what you just said before. This is the interpretation of the universe according to the materialist scientific view that states evolution, that we come from monkeys and this kind of thing, and that we are the brain and there's no such thing as a... So that's the view, isn't it? That's, that's that interpretation of that model. Would you agree? It's an interpretation I, I, of the world. I, I do. I don't know. I don't care. No, just stop. Stop, darling. No, no, stop, stop. I'm Listen, convinced. what I'm trying to get at is this, sweetheart. What I'm trying to get at. Do you accept that what you stated before is, a, is, is the view of the world according to the scientific view? Yes. Isn't it? Yes. So it's just a view. You agree? It's someone's, it's, it's someone's presentation. I think it's kind of the best representation. I don't care whether you think it's the best. That's well, not the discussion. Proven. No, no, it's not proven. It's total Close rubbish. To it's total rubbish. It's not proven. So you're not Darwin. No, listen to me. No, listen. No, no. Don't, get, don't mistake <laughs> my point here. Don't mistake my point. Please try and hear my point. We'll go gradually. First, can we establish that in this world there are lots of different interpretations about how things exist? Would you accept that? You've got your Chinese people who have acupuncture. Then you've got your Hindu views. Then you've got your Christian views. Then you've got your communist views. You can't see my point. Then you've got your Buddhist views. Then you've got your materialist scientific views. They are, they're all equal insofar as they're a viewpoint coming from human minds about how things exist. Can you try and give them equal status in that sense? Whether they're right or wrong, or you like them or not, isn't the issue yet. That's not the issue yet. But you, but you hear my point. Yeah. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Don't, that's not the point first. We've got to put ourselves out there and look at all these viewpoints. They are viewpoints. Okay, they're viewpoints. Good. Now, the Buddha has a view, which you've just been hearing about, and of course it clashes 100 massively with the view you just stated. So, but there is a way of interpreting both and putting them together. But first of all, I need to say that the, what you just said was that the evolution review, which you are suggesting is the right one, is the best one. That's fine. You're allowed to think that. That's okay. But I want to look at it. Is that you know the animals? If they, if we didn't eat them, they'd eat us. And this is survival evolution. This is exactly the, the, the whoever it was, Mr. Who? Who was it first? Who was the guy? Mr. Who? Mr. Darwin. Okay, Mr. Darwin came up with this. Okay, and this is a pretty prevalent view in this world as an interpretation of you know the, that, that picture of the of the monkey and gradually the man, all this business. Yeah, I understand. It's a detailed description of with masses of assumptions about what a person is, what a mind is, what anger is, what instinct for survival is. All these all these findings. So there's a, another Buddhist way of saying that. So for example, the Buddhist way to say that the uh, you know uh, let's say a thousand years ago. I don't know what creatures were. Let's say there. Okay, way a way to put it is this: the way to try and put the two Buddhists, the two views together. There are these physical shapes. They're called elephants, dogs, humans. You know, monkeys, apes, and all this picture of you know the man and before the hominus, This one, that all the people who talk about these things, Darwin's business. You know, years, ago, thousands of years ago, millions of years ago, you had those big creatures. What are they called? Dinosaurs, right? <laughs> all these creatures. They're all. Physical, they're physical, they're made of the four elements, and they are the body of a sentient being. They're a body of a sentient being. Okay? You get that? That's a Buddhist way of saying it. A sentient being is a mind that, due to karmic causes in the past, that mind doing actions that they did created the cause to, if you like, put it this way, due to their actions, they're searching after they die for a suitable house to go and live in that suits their mind. Well, you might have got a lion house. You got a, a, a dinosaur's house. You got a, you got a tiger's house. You got an ant's house. That's a type of mind that fits with that body. 
And so all the mummy t lions work away as being lions and they give birth to new lions and they evolve over the centuries. Well, each of those occupants of those lion bodies very nicely cause the evolution and the change by their behavior to make a different lion's body now, 10,000 years later. So when I, due to negative karma, Buddha would say it's negative karma from much aggression and killing, I've now created the cause to go to my suitable lion's house. So yes, all my previous lions, when I'm a lion, have change the shape of that house by the way they behave, but it's just a house. And then sentient beings who have karma with that behavior will go to that body, and then they will help change the evolution for the next lions that are coming. But the point is we say we, you meant we meaning human, they meaning animals, but honey, Buddha would say your mind is in a human body right now, but honey, it can be in the lion's body next life. So there's no we in that sense. We can identify with the human houses. Sure we can. But minds go into those according to karma. So there is a way of describing it this way. So there is evolution, sure, but it's due to sentient beings behaving in certain ways. And then we sentient beings create those houses, create dinosaur bodies, create the cause to then go to a dinosaur. When all the dinosaurs have gone, we've got to look for another body. So we go to lions and elephants and giraffes and Lord knows what. And we keep changing life after life due to behavior. Because all sentient beings, all animals, all humans, all creatures, all fishes, are just the product of minds and their karma, and what those minds have done. We create the cause to get a fish body. We And we create those fish bodies. Just the elements manifesting as a fish, manifesting as a dog, manifesting as a lion. It's all done by minds. And minds are not physical and they're beginningless. But then how can a lion ever change to It can. It's very difficult. It can. It's extremely difficult. But it can because, I'll tell you, it doesn't change. It has to keep, when I get born a lion, like if I get born as a lion, that means very strong negative anger, well, strong anger and aggression rises in my human mind. Due to habit in this life, I then die, and then when I go into the intermediate state, I'm, I'm looking for another house, if you like, that's suitable to my crazy mind. Now I've got uh, lion karma and I run like a magnet to my mummy lion's womb. So all my human qualities, all my goodness, my virtue, my kindness, my love, my wisdom that I have done is there, but it's now buried. It can't manifest in my lion's life. So as a lion, I harm others, I'm brutal, I'm, I'm negative, I kill, I'm following my instinct, I eat the buffalo's body for breakfast every day, never seeing the buffalo suffering because I'm so ignorant, so much suffering. So I create more and more negative karma every second. But all the virtue in me from countless other human lives is sitting there latent, waiting for the appropriate conditions to ripen. And eventually all that track of negative karma will cease and then one day I'm born a little dog to a little Buddhist mummy and you say little mantras in my ear and then when I die that'll activate my virtuous karma and then I'll get a human life again. It's quite difficult but it's not impossible because the karma is all there. That's how they talk. That's how they say. So that's why they say when you want to be a human, don't try not to lose it. <laughs> because, we have, because we have lots and lots and lots of negative karmas from being an animal in our countless lives. And, you know, whale and dog, we've got all those karmic seeds sitting in our mind waiting for the condition to ripen. So don't let them ripen, baby. That's the whole idea. That's how they talk. Because Buddha says there are trillions. There's a very interesting view. You know, he says... And I know this is different from the world's view. I'm just telling you what Buddha says, okay, in my kind of Australian way, okay? But there are trillions of minds, he would say. There's not an atom, in fact, there's not an atom of space. You won't find something <laughs> being here. They say under your armpit is like a zoo, you know. In your body, look when you get those big animals and you put this telescope in, or the, the, the microscope, it's like a zoo in that body. And they're the ones we can see, all the creatures. Billions. So wherever there is, wherever there are beings, wherever there is stuff, it's, it's a conducive environment for sentient beings to live there. You know, because Sorry, what does a conducive mean? sentient being. What does sentient mean? It's the word that Buddhism uses to refer to living beings. Mind possessor is the Tibetan term. And where's the limit? Is a tree a sentient being? No, a tree would be considered not a sentient being. Okay. Insects, tiny creatures, there are lots of ones called ghosts and spirits and other beings called hell beings, other beings called god beings. There's many kinds we can't see. What about bacteria? And they could be sentient beings, but it's hard to know. It's hard to know by looking whether that, even if it moves, it's hard to know if it's a mind. It's hard to know. You know, we can deduce that you're a sentient being because you walk and so talk and it's, like it's hard to know. Bacteria, then I'm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, sweetheart, forget bacteria, forget penicillin, 
just by existing, you're harming sentient beings. You're breathing in creatures. You're just, you know, even the ordinary food you eat, the creatures who live inside you mightn't like it. We can't help but harm sentient beings every second because the universe is pervaded by sentient beings. And everywhere there are the elements, there are sentient beings. This is why the Buddha says just being born in these ordinary bodies is in the nature of suffering. So the very li the best we can do is create is have the aspiration to not try to harm. At least if you see a living being that you can recognize, try not to harm it. The best we can do is this. It's if, if the whole world became mm -hmm. Buddhist, that's right. Then all human beings would die. We, all we, beings would cease and there'd be no longer universes. Mm -hmm. There'd just be blissful minds pervading the universe with no matter. Yep, that, we've all Buddha minds. But if the, the animals would kill us. What's that? They would well, kill the animals. animals. They would start. Well, no, darling, you see, it's impossible because if, no, listen, sweetheart, no, listen, listen, listen. If all the humans stop being born as humans, then we'd, that means we're also stopping becoming lions and tigers. There'd be no lions and tigers either because lions and tigers are reborn humans who are who behave negatively. So once we stop behaving negatively, we're also stopping being, being elephants and dogs. So we'd so all the sentient beings would stop altogether. I mean, don't hold your breath, be. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So do the, we do the best we can, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, let's do a bit of meditation. I'll lead you through one of these little visualization meditations. Just get the hang of it. If you don't like it, you can sit there and relax. You don't need to do what I say. But I'll just give you the feeling of it. Try to use these kind of ideal kind of personifications of these energies of, the, of positive energy. All of these represent different, like I said, psychological qualities that we have the potential to accomplish, you know? That's all they are. So we'll just kind of do a little meditation on the Buddha called Tara. Very easy going to show you the style. It's a very simple example. Okay. <coughs> so be very natural and relaxed. Just have your eyes closed. But let me go through the, the, the best way to sit, the ideal way, okay, that's considered the most uh, conducive to a good meditation, classically taught. So best would be to what they call in full lotus position. If you can do it, then marvelous. Your left leg up on top of your right, and you're you know, and nicely tight. Then the body is very stable, and also it aligns all the subtler energies in a very nice way. If we can do this, marvelous. If not, just sit ordinary cross-legged. If not that, we sit in a chair. You know, we do what we can. That's the first point. There's about eight points. The second one is your back. It's really important, they say, to have your back ramrod straight. Of course, as soon as we do this, we get all this tension in our muscles. So they say the spine should be like an arrow, absolutely straight, and the coccyx pointing into the earth. That's the head of the arrow. So get a feeling for this, very straight. And then your shoulders, very square and straight, right? But then have a feeling, this is what I like to say this for myself, it helps my mind. Think of your skeleton, like your skeleton, all the bones, and it's hanging on a hanger. It's completely upright, isn't it? Ramrod straight, everything's straight, perfect. But all the flesh and soft bits, like hanging on the bones, very relaxed. So upright, but relaxed. So consciously relax your shoulders, but have them upright. Relax your abdomen, but keep your back upright. So it's a nice combination of upright, but relaxed. Okay. The next one is your hands, the kind of various positions that the meditators like to do. But the classic one that we're taught is like this, the left behind underneath, the right on top, forming a triangle. And I've heard that there are two subtle channels meeting at the tip of the thumbs that's related to bodhicitta. I don't know much more about that, but that's what they say. So then, you can have your hands on your knees as you wish, it doesn't matter. And if you are sitting in a chair, if you can, have your feet firmly on the ground. Keep your back upright and don't slump into the back of the chair. It's important you stay upright. You hold your own body upright, that's important. Otherwise you slump. The next part is your head and have it slightly tilted forward. The chin kind of tucked in, you know, slightly. Having your head thrust back makes the mind agitated, slightly thrust, slightly tilted forward. Then your jaw, very relaxed, and it's helpful to have the jaw, the lips open, slightly apart, just slightly. And then have the tip of the tongue resting behind the top teeth. This seems odd, but actually it's really helpful if you meditate a lot because it stops you from having to dribble or to swallow your spit a lot, you know. The tip of the tongue behind the top teeth. Mm -hmm. 
And now breathing um, through your nose, very relaxed, breathing through your nose, unlike the dog who's snoring. Mm. Can we stop her snoring? Yes. All right, good. I mean, if we can have nice and quiet, it's helpful. If not, we have to practice patience. Okay. Don't you go away. You stay. Let it be. Put it down. Okay. I mean, if she snores, just move her. Otherwise, we have to practice patience. That's good for us, okay? Snoring dog in our meditation. Mm -hmm. So then, then the next thing is your eyes, okay? It's very interesting. They all say that the holy meditators all say it's best to have your eyes open because if you're meditating in the day, then the light comes in which keeps your mind very bright and sharp. But obviously most of us get very distracted because we not good, got, haven't got good concentration. So we can have your eyes largely closed perhaps, but your eyes beneath your eyelids should be looking down as if you're looking along your nose at the ground, okay? Like that. So your legs, your back, your whole body relaxed, the shoulders square, tilted forward, head, chin tucked in, jaw relaxed, lips apart, tip of the tongue behind the top teeth, eyes looking down. So now just settle very naturally, very unselfconsciously into this position, okay? And so we just now go straight to the meditation. Just imagine, to the best of our ability, if you've never done it before, don't worry, just do your best. If you have, then do what you know. We visualize in front of us the emanation of all the Buddha's qualities in this form called Tara. She, it means actually liberator, and she's often referred to as the liberator from the fears of samsara. Samsara just being the word Buddha uses to refer to being caught up in all this misery and dramas and attachment and junk, you know, which we all know so well. That's what samsara is, not some place. So by, Tara represents this power, success, action energy, courage, cutting through the obstacles, making things happen, being successful. She represents that energy, okay? So as often this kind of action energy is represented as female, quick, kind of quick energy, it's female energy. Wisdom energy is often female energy depicted. So now you visualize her she, in this body type of style as you see in the paintings and it's light, green, she's got green light which is like action energy. Comple everything's made of light, everything's blissful radiant light. This gorgeous blissful looking green light energy lady. She's sitting on a multicolored lotus and her r left leg is drawn in like in meditation but her right leg is out a little bit resting on another multicolored lotus like in a very relaxed pose, this is called this action pose. Rather than meditation, she's in action energy, which is she's, she's prepared to hop up and benefit sentient beings, do what needs to be done. It represents this, you know, action mode. She's got, like, and you see the paintings, you know, often the, and such statues. That these most of these Buddhas, their their bodies are naked. She's got these gorgeous breasts, you know, beautiful energy. They say all the Buddhas are like in the aspect of 16, 16 years old. They're meant to energize you, to make you blissful, you know, to energize your senses. The form of the Buddha as a monk, which represents the first stages of practice, he's meant to subdue our body, speech, and mind. He's the manifestation of subdued body, speech, and mind. So here we are in Tantra, more advanced meditation level in Mahayana, based upon emptiness, renunciation, and compassion, energize us, to energize us, okay? So she's got these gorgeous multicolored sort of silken clothes, the lower part of her body, you know, around her legs. And then in the Indian sort of aristocratic style, you see that she's got these gorgeous kind of decorated with beautiful jewels like they do, you know, that there's this five pointed crown on her head. Her hair, you can see it's partially held up in a top knot, decorated with lovely jewels. And the rest of her hair is down her back, black hair, of course, Indian. Then she's got this beautiful five-pointed crown on her head, a bit like a tiara on the front of her head. Then jewels on her neck, throat, you know, throat, upper arms, ears, wrists, ankles, feet. Just gorgeous, beautiful, dazzling. Everything's radiant, dazzling. And she's completely blissful, utterly beautiful. Can't keep your eyes off her. You know? So gorgeous. Her face, extremely compassionate. Beautiful eyes, full of compassion. Sweet red mouth. Absolutely radiant. And if we do happen to have a spiritual teacher, a lama we've committed to, we think it's their mind, whether they're male or female, doesn't matter. Our lama manifesting as Tara for my benefit. Lama, Tara, same thing. 
You think like this. Benefit, make, manifesting solely to benefit me, to show me how I can become. She's showing me what I can become. You know? So she's looking at me very lovingly, very blissful, these beautiful red eyes. Sometimes you see her eyes are kind of slightly wide open. She's slightly wrathful. Sometimes it's quite peaceful looking. depends. So now we imagine, so kind, so compassionate, very happily, she, from her brow, you imagine she sends these powerful beams of radiant white laser light beams that enter very forcefully our brow and instantly fill us with powerful white light. And what we think what this does is in, in, instantly purifies all of our aches and pains and all of our sickness and all the cancer and all the suffering and all the hurt, the physical. And then all the countless seeds that we have planted from beginningless lives of harming sentient beings with our body. In all the lives as animals, you know. I mean, just a whale, which we've been countless times, put it says, opens its mouth for one mouthful of one breakfast and 40 million sentient beings go in. So they spend their lives completely ignorantly killing each other, you know. So we've done all these countless things and these countless imprints are in our minds. So we happily think all of this powerful radiant white light totally purifies every seed of every negativity I've ever done since beginningless time to sentient beings with my body. Full of this radiant white light. Imagine this. So marvellous. And again, she so compassionately sends these beams of light from her brow that enter our brow, instantly filling us, this time with our amazing potential as a Buddha to only benefit sentient beings. Full of, our body feels full of bliss and this effortless power, you think, to whoever sees me, whoever touches me, whoever hears me, whoever smells me, whoever tastes me, they can only be benefited by me. Imagine this. That whoever I see and see and meet, I can only benefit them. And of course, the power of a Buddha in the future to manifest many bodies to help others. I now you think my body, the purpose of it, to benefit sentient beings. How incredible. Full of this blissful white light. This potential. My potential. Again, Lama Tara, this time from her throat, sends radiant, powerful beams of red light, laser light, that penetrate our throat and instantly fill us with this blissful red light. And what it does first is instantly purify all the imprints of all the harm we've ever done since beginning this time with our speech <coughs> to sentient beings. And this is mainly as humans. You know, the harsh speech, the lying, all the speculating, all the rabbiting on about nothing, all the talking about people behind their backs creating disharmony, all these actions about speech. You know. mm -hmm. Totally, since beginning this time, all these imprints instantly annihilated by this radiant red light filling me. Mm -hmm. So blissful.
Again, Lama Tara sends these radiant beams of red light that enter our throat for us this time now We're with our potential. What else? And what does this mean? This means our effortless, perfect capacity to benefit those who hear us. So we can just think whatever word we say, even if it's saying hello, is necessarily of benefit to hears us, to who hears us. Can you imagine this? All the birds, all the creatures, all the humans, every word I say. And this is really what they call the power of speech. It's the real gift of the Buddha, the ability to give us the right advice at the right time to help us on our way. This is the most marvelous gift to give sentient beings. And imagine this amazing potential, such that every word we say is of use to who hears us. Imagine this, full of this marvelous red light. And now from her heart, in the center of her chest, Lama Tara sends this time radiant beams of blue light, blue like the sky, penetrating into our heart, filling us instantly, this time purifying all the delusions, the ego grasping, the root delusion, the clinging to the neurotic self, the, the attachment to get what that self wants, which gives rise to the aversion, the anger, the despair, the depression where it doesn't which gives rise to the jealousy, the arrogance, all the other variations, all the nonsense that causes us so much pain and which of course is the source of why I harm others. All of this instantly annihilated by this blissful blue light filling me. Again, Lama Tara sends his blue light, this time filling us with what else but our potential. And that is what? Utter bliss. Because the mind, when it's finished with the junk, is, is only blissful. It's our natural state. This is very surprising to us. But this is the experience of all the meditations. When the delusions are even temporarily there, not there, there is only bliss. There is only contentment, bliss, joy, fulfillment. Not to mention all the virtues. Naturally, love, compassion, empathy kindness, generosity, courage, all the marvelous qualities which are at the core of our being now fully manifesting. Blissful, blissful blue light for you. So now imagine that Lama Tara this time sends the three lights simultaneously. And what this does is it removes what they call the obstacles to omniscience, even subtler, you know, subtler imprints in the mind. I remember one time one Lama saying, the first three, this removes all the obstacles to our liberation from samsara, and it's like removing the garlic from the jar. But now this next one is even removing even the subtlest imprints, even the smell, removing even the subtlest imprints that prevent us from being a Buddha. And we see these three together, the white to the brow, red to the throat, blue to the heart, manifesting our own perfect Tara nature. Imagine this. So now, 
we imagine Namachara very happily if we think of this multicolored lotus she's sitting on and the multicolored lotus that her right foot is resting on, they just dissolve into light up into her body. Just like that, right there. Everything's made of light, remember? And so now she, very happily, you imagine, she gets up and she comes over and she sits above our heads, facing the same way as us. Our Lama, Tara. Think of this way. It's blissful green light energy representing all these marvelous qualities. So now you think very happily wanting to be oneness with our body, speech and mind. She dissolves into green light and then she merges through our crown, this energy, this green energy, you think like this, completely filling you. So that your body and your body, Tara's body, your speech, Tara's speech, your mind, Tara's mind, and the Lama's, same thing, no distinction. So just be full of this blissful enlightened energy, just for a moment. This is me. And then now think that this just have a feeling of this blissful, clear, enlightened energy, mine, who I am, expanding limitlessly. Limitlessly. Your sense of self is infinite now. Blissful, clear, Tara, infinite, enlightened, perfect, blissful, clear, vast as the universe. And just kind of abide in this space, no thoughts, just this blissful sense of your infinite compassionate mind, no thoughts. Abide in this for a couple of minutes. Keep focused. Don't space out. Focused, but no thoughts. Thoughts come, just let them disappear like clouds. So now I think, this is fine, I'm the Buddha now, great, good for me. But what about sentient beings? I've worked all these countless lives to become a Buddha so I can benefit them, that's my job. So because of my infinite wisdom, my infinite compassion, my infinite power, feel I can do this. So now imagine in front of us all sentient beings. So we can see, see them divided into the three categories, there's no fourth category. Right in front of us, the objects of our aversion, our anger. You might think you use the word enemy, but it's a convenient label here for those who are the object of your aversion. People you don't like, irritate you, annoy you, upset you, even have harmed you brutally. Think like this. You know. Put them there, right in front, your enemies. Even the ugly politicians, the one you can't stand. They're your enemies, you know. Think of one or two of them and put them all there. Imagine them there, in front, eyeball to eyeball. Then to the left in front of you, all your dearest beloveds, the ones you're attached to, close to, whom you adore, put them there to the left in front of you. Objects of your attachment. And now the, to the right, but everywhere else as well, the third category, which is 99.9999% of the universe, the strangers, who are the object of your complete indifference, you know? And who are they? They're people who've neither harmed nor helped you. And of course, about whom we couldn't care less. Strangers. To the right and then behind you, to the side, above, below, as far as your eye can see. Per pervade space, up, down, below you, to the sides, infinite as far as the, as, the, as the universe can stretch, you know, full of these strangers, think, full of these strangers, amazing, trillions and trillions. The 
the objects of your indifference, and the enemies, the objects of your aversion, the friends, the objects of your attachment. There's no fourth category actually. It's the whole universe. So now we think, now that I'm Buddha, what choice do I have? I must benefit. No choice. So imagine from our hearts, trillions and trillions of tiny green Taras just effortlessly emanate out, enter first into the hearts of the enemies, and you see them be free of their suffering, fulfill all their needs, and then turn them into their Tara. Just imagine this the best you can. It's the enemies, the friends, and all the strangers. And these emanations from your heart are going out behind you, above you, below you, as far as you can imagine, giving, taking away the suffering of all sentient beings, giving them all their happiness, and turning them into their own Buddha. Just for even a minute, just imagine this. Just use your imagination, that's all. Imagine it. Want it. Think it. Visualize it. How amazing. <coughs> As we keep visualizing for another minute, that's enough, we will then sing the mantra of Tara. If you know it, just listen. If you know it, join in. If you don't, just listen. And even as imagine as the sound goes out, you imagine that green light rains down and blesses even more all these sentient beings for radiant space. Imagine this, continuing to visualize. Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Soha 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 Om Tare Tu Tare Ture So imagine all these suffering sentient beings turned into their own tyra, trillions of tyras. And then just finish by imagining they all dissolve into green light and all dissolve into you, enhancing even more brilliantly your own tyra nature. Just imagine that. And then relax. Okay. That's a really general, general way that you trans use this particular this approach to doing meditation, utilizing the Buddhas, utilizing these different because they're all many kinds. It's, it's peaceful, male, wrathful, female, all kinds. You know, of these Buddha emanations. They're just psychological qualities. So, by personifying them, especially seeing them as one that's with your Lama, it makes it very personal. Then there's just these skillful methods of absorbing into you and identifying and saying the mantra and lots of other things in these meditations that one could do. But this is the really simple principle, you know. And this practice based upon concentration and the realization of emptiness 
eventually manifest, and there's far more sophisticated levels of these practices, which is an actual method for you to become that Buddha. Yeah. You're identifying with that particular energy. So they're very marvelous psychology, and it is just simply psychology based on all this approach, you know. So that's the idea. So if you have any questions we can have, otherwise we can finish and go home. Any questions? No? No? Put it there? Nothing? Makes sense? No, someone who's never done it before. Who's never done it before? <coughs> Does it make any sense? You can kind of see the logic of it or is it weird? It was a lot of people on the right side. I don't seem to see a lot of strangers. That's right, you're right. <laughs> you're true, it's the vast majority, isn't it? <laughs> it's true. But the... Um, well, uh, can you uh, say something about uh, these uh, three colors? Why is it like that? I don't know. No, I don't. They use colors matter. in all these different ways, all the different matter. meaning, different traditions. It's just okay. a style. It's just a lineage, it's a tradition, okay. you know. And other colors are used in other ways, other practices. So there's no absolute meaning to them. It's just style, approach, you know, in different ways. Yeah. But blue is often used the mind when you purify the, you visualize it here the mind they talk about the mind here and then you when you and then when you're visualizing just pure vast no thoughts it's blue because it's like the sky it's a good kind of analogy for emptiness space ah, blue okay, you know? okay. yeah like that it's just a nice analogy okay. so no questions I have one. Yes, John. Uh, I was curious, you were talking about uh, being able to transform the, the blissful energy, like like when I ate the brownie uh, at lunch, it was really great, and then I had this, I mean, if I were a more advanced person yeah. uh, with Tantra, I could transform the, the blissful energy. All that means is this. But, okay, in a simple way, even for us at ordinary level, yeah. it's like this. Normally speaking, when we're mindless, we're not thinking, and we just shove the food in, don't we? we just, oh, that delicious brownie, and shove it in. Oh, is this delicious? And it's just all automatic, and there's no consciousness, there's no awareness, there's no, there's no thought of others. You're just shoving it into your stuff. Oh, I couldn't eat any more. Blah, you know, that's a gross way. That's how we are, and that's all. That's just attachment. That's it. So with awareness, we first we can think. Even like we start with the food, oh, I forgot to do it for you guys. For your lunch, you think of it first as empty, no inherent nature, already in space. And then even before you begin to eat it, you can then think of it as delicious nectar. And there's all these meditations in Tantra where you visualize it as nectar, you transform it, you this, and it becomes this amazing nectar. You just practice in the beginning. Yeah. And then you will then think of offering it, even before you've eaten it yet, and then you will eat it. And so because your mind, as you get transformed, is less grasping, less attachment, more seeing it as empty, it naturally is a more blissful experience. Naturally. There's more calm mind, which is it's related to, you're very calm and relaxed. There's no grasping at it. Like no, and see, attachment, when it's very strong, makes your mind very dull. You know, when you're really hungry, even just have a piece of toast. You think, oh, did I even eat that toast? Mm -hmm. You don't even remember because you did it so mindlessly. That's what attachment causes. So this stops you from the mindlessness and makes you conscious and much more blissful, truly blissful, lighter, more spacious. And as you keep getting advanced, that becomes more, more advanced. So the transforming of it is the very having of it without grasping it. That's all. And it becomes finer and finer and more, more radiant and more powerful as we get more advanced. I guess what I'm curious about is um, I've also experienced feeling like kind of negative feelings, like uh, if, if I get angry or irritated, if there's also kind of a lot of energy in that, and with the being able to kind of hold back from acting, sure, that's that, right. I can still be, like feel the energy cool. of that. Is well, that's just the physical energy. Is that that's just physical, the darling. Same as no, I'll tell you, that's just physical. Okay, listen, okay. listen. So that's just physical. That's just the body. That's fine. So what happens is like this, and if you look at all these Buddhas, like I mentioned, there's these peaceful ones, wrathful ones. So let's say there's one, there's one Buddha called Yamantaka, who's like a manifestation of angry energy, and he's fierce as can be, you know. And so what they mean by purify, so attachment energy is um, like I just using the simple example of a cake. Now if you're a mummy and you have a child and you told her, you know, I always use the example, you said no more chocolate four times, and she hasn't heard you. You know if you've got a, if you're a, even just an ordinary person, genuinely caring for your child, genuinely knowing how to help your child because you know their mind, you have to use a wrathful method, don't you? She didn't hear you. I said no more. You go to your room now. That looks like angry, doesn't it? 
You know it's coming from pure compassion. This is lying, but you, it can be. It's possible. It's called tough love. And often even an ordinary mother has to have courageous to do that because we're too scared to upset our babies, you know. And we let them all let them have it because it's our own laziness. But to really care for your child, to really know it's not good for their mind, forget their teeth. You would do that for their sake. So that, but and if the, if you're a good mother, the child will know it's for their sake, and they'll feel remorse, and then they've got the lesson. So that's called that's called tough love. That's transforming anger. It's a simple example, darling. It's not esoteric. Okay. You but, see, but the feeling energy is just physical. It's just physical, darling. It's okay. Physical. Because so in tantra, no, because in tantra. In the tantric model, which is the same as in Tibetan medical, we have these subtler physical energies, and there's no time to go. We can talk about it now. We can do more tomorrow. But it's a highly cultivated, highly developed technical explanation of our subtler energies. And these great yogis can use it completely. So there's this intimate, there's this a subtle energy, 72,000 subtle channels our body is made of, subtle. And then the wind energies, the prana, is going through all those channels, and each, all the winds are intimately connected with different states of our mind. It's just their nature. Their mind and winds are naturally connected. Okay, and so then when the mind is strongly attached, look at the energy that goes inside our body. Attachment energy is linked to certain wind energies. So when the attachment is very strong, look at like sexual energy. Look at the energies flying around the body like berserk. You know, even just thinking about your gorgeous new beloved, your body feels great because the wind energies. Attachment has got its own relationship with certain winds. Attachment is all excited mind, and it triggers the winds, and that triggers very nice feelings. It's just the way it is. It's technical. So not being attached to that energy is really when you're advanced. Okay. The feelings, you see. You see oh, stop, wait. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Let me finish. Mm -hmm. I must finish. Then you understand. Do you hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the same with anger, isn't it? The winds and anger energy are also connected, are also coursing through our veins. When you're really angry, it's like it's like it's like you're in a storm. The wind, the energies are raging. Your mind, your body, your mouth, it spits coming. You can't control. Look at a child who's out of control. That's the wind energies that are connected to anger gone berserk. So like you just described, you feel that anger, but you have got enough discipline not to express it. Well, well done. That's, that's improvement. That's, 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 that's practice. But eventually when you're really advanced, you won't have that energy. You won't come anymore because your mind is so clear and pure. But you'll be able to manifest whatever's necessary, even shouting at someone for their benefit, without any wanting to harm them, without any anger whatsoever. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. I guess okay. what I'm so confused about is where's the the, the bliss energy then? What? Because I think I I thought the energy that we were doing, we were transforming was this physical energy. Darling, no. That's just one aspect of it. No, way more subtle than that. Physical is way more, way more beyond this physical. The physical is like gross. We are, we are learning, by learning to know the mind, by learning to understand what attachment is, what anger is, what jealousy is, which you learn in high school, then you combine it, compassion with it and emptiness, and then you get to Tantra. What you're transforming is attachment and anger, not the physical energy. Okay. That's called pleasure or upset. Yeah. That is just energy. That's really not what you're transforming. You're transforming. You can say you're transforming pleasure, strictly, but it's 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 when the mind is subdued, the attachment and the anger and the jealousy all are qualities of mind. They're the ones you're using. They're the ones you're transforming and using those for the benefit of the sentiment. Okay, I'll think about it. Okay, bye. <laughs> well, why don't we go home now? Time to go home. Don't you think? Enough food for thought to sink a ship, <coughs> sink several ships. So then you think, t t so we just dedicate, and then you think tonight when you go to sleep, you watch your dreams, see yourself, see your dreams as dreams. You wake up in the morning, you bliss out, you're still alive, amazing. You're not dead yet. Your petrol tank of morality hasn't run out yet. You've still got this karma to be this human, to continue to practice, think about the meaning of things, so you can get some wisdom and compassion and benefit sentient beings. So we dedicate. This amazing job we've done all day, listening, thinking, analyzing, meditating, a few pennies dropping maybe, a few food for thought maybe. We dedicate all of this in just the way we motivated so that we can develop our potential for Buddhahood as quickly as possible for the sake of suffering, so many things, no matter how long it takes. Chang chur sem chog rinpoche ma khe pa nam khe gyu chik khe pa nyam pa me pa yang gong ne gong du pa va shu That's all.
Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay.